So we're interested in this, this phenomenon that's um, uh, been observed in deep networks. I mean, all, all that I'm going to say that's rigorous here is about uh, the linear case. So, you know, nice classical things. Um, but but in, a, in a somewhat unusual setting. So this, this phenomenon is that um, deep networks can be trained to, to zero loss on the training data, uh, even with regression losses, uh, and still give pretty good predictive accuracy, which is really rather striking, uh, even, even on noisy problems. So in this, this is an example from a, a paper by Zhang et al, uh, looking at... <coughs> Uh, an, an image classification problem. This is a Cypher 10 data set. Um, on the x-axis on these two plots is the level of label corruption. So they're introducing errors, introducing noise into the, into the training sample. Uh, on, the, on the left, there's, there's no noise introduced. On the right, every, every example has a randomly chosen label. So it's complete nonsense. Um, and and uh, the top plot shows how long it takes to... to choose parameters that get zero error on the training sample. And uh, arriving at those parameters, the bottom plot shows the predictive accuracy. And you'll see that, that things are gradually degrading. Right now, that's really striking because this is a regression loss. In this case, it's being driven to zero um, with, with uh, certainly noisy data because they're introducing noise. Um, and, and yet, the performance is, is uh, smoothly degrading. So this is very unusual. Lots of other cases where this has been observed with deep networks and with other sorts of uh, uh, prediction rules. Um, the striking th thing here is there's no trade-off between the fit to the training data and the complexity. You're getting a perfect fit to the training data right? in, in, in all of these cases. Um, and yet, so, so certainly we're fitting as well as you can hope to fit. Right? It's, a, it's a, a global minimum to get zero loss. Um, uh, but that, that overfitting is benign in this case. Right? So we use overfitting to mean bad predictive accuracy, but actually, you know, it's just a, a phenomenon on the, the, the training data, and, and in fact, we're getting good predictive accuracy in this case. All right, and, and of course, you know, as, um, as we all know, um, classically, we, we aim for some kind of trade-off between fit to the training data and the complexity of a prediction rule. Um, so for instance, we might be considering the quadratic loss that we see um, on our, our sample, in this case of size n, and f hat here is our, is our predicted, um, uh, f, f hat of xi is the prediction on, on, on example xi. Um, uh, we want to trade off that sort of a um, quantity with the complexity of f hat, and maybe, maybe we measure the complexity in terms of the number of parameters, in terms of the scale of those parameters, um, the norm of a, a function in a function space, you know, all of these things, or in a, a, other kinds of non-parametric prediction methods, maybe it's the bandwidth of a smoothing kernel. You know, there are many different notions of complexity, but we're always, in a non-parametric world, we're always in this situation of trading off between the, the fit to the training data and the complexity of the prediction rule. All right, in the previous talks that we've seen today, that lambda is always positive, all right? Unless, unless you happen to be in the world of, of pack learning, right, where you make the assumption that, that there is an f uh, that gets y exactly right. So, so there's a functional relationship between x and y. There's no noise in y. But, um, you know, that's not the real world. There's always noise in Y. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, it's really, really rather striking not to be trading these, these two off. And, and, you know, in, in classes, these are examples we give our students, right? If, if you're interpolating the data with, you know, a polynomial, that's a bad thing to do. Because you're interpolating, you know, it's noisy data, you will have, you will have bad predictive accuracy. Um, so many, many examples of, of this kind. So, you know, I think this is, um, what did the physics journal say? This is really novel. Uh, <laughs> right, this is genuinely a new phenomenon that I don't think people have looked at um, un until the last couple of years. Um, we're, we're seeing a case where, where um, you know, many examples where we get good predictive accuracy, even though we're, we're disobeying this, this uh, statistical wisdom that says we should be trading off the fit to the data and the, and the complexity of the function. Okay, so we wanted to look at, at um, this sort of phenomenon in, you know, motivated by, by these examples that the, the um, uh, practitioners in, in deep learning have revealed, but look at the phenomenon in a case where we can actually analyze things, so in the linear case. Um, okay, so over the last couple of years, there's been a bunch of work on this 
on this uh, question. Um, it really came out of a uh, um, uh, spring 2017 program on foundations of machine learning at the, at the Simons Institute. Um, there were a bunch of us there that got, got interested in, in this observation that you know, actually you seem to be in a, in a new regime for these um, uh, deep learning methods. Um, so uh, the, first, the first example of this sort of a uh, interpolating prediction rule that um, uh, you know, does, does well uh, was um, simplicial interpolation, so something that has a flavor of a nearest neighbor rule uh, but does a linear interpolation on, on uh, within uh, a simplex in a, a simplicial decomposition of the, of the training sample. Um, there are other examples involving kernel smoothing. Um, again, uh, Misha Belkin and, and Daniel Su, um, and then subsequent work with uh, Sasha Rucklin and Sasha Sibakov. Um, so looking at kernel smoothing with crazy kernels that go to infinity at, the, at, at zero so that you know, you're guaranteed to interpolate. Um, uh, and, and in fact, with these things, you can show um, uh, for a suitable choice of the kernel bandwidth, you get, you get minimax rates. Um, uh, there's been some work also on linear regression um, uh, in, in a bunch of different directions over the last uh, two years, um, notably this, this work of uh, Teng Yuen Liang and Sasha Rocklin, and also um, uh, some results of uh, Hasty et al. looking at um, random matrix theory kind of um, uh, machinery to understand what happens as the, the dimension and sample size uh, go to infinity together. So the results that um, I want to talk about are also in this linear regression setting, but we get a characterization of the, um, uh, the excess risk in this setting. Uh, so we can understand when an interpolating, specific interpolating prediction rule in this setting is going to, to predict well uh, and when it's not. So let me tell you about, about that result and I'll have a few comments about you know, how it's related to deep learning um, and, and this phenomenon of adversarial examples, um, which you know, I think in the linear case is really, is really very uh, clear what's going, wh why you should expect adversarial examples when you're um, uh, in, this, in this overfitting regime. Um, okay, so the main result is, is, as I say, for a linear regression setting. So, so let me fix some notation, um, just so we're all on the, on the same page. We're talking about um, predicting a real valued response when we have a covariate vector x. Uh, everything works in infinite dimensions, but you can think of x as being a, a vector in Euclidean space. And I'm gonna use matrix vector notation um, just to make things a little, a little more compact. Uh, but but you know, as I say, it's all um, uh, works in a Hilbert space. Um, uh, for presenting the result, I'm going to talk about x, y being jointly Gaussian and mean zero, um, but you know, we can extend things there um, you know, with, with some appropriate assumptions that are an immediate consequence of, of x and y being jointly Gaussian. So I'll say a little more about that later. Um, and, and there are three kind of crucial pieces of notation that, that we'll need. Uh, the first is the covariance of the x's, our, our vector of covariance. Right, and, and in particular, we're going to express it as a spectral decomposition, so it's these lambda i's that are important, right? the, the, the variance in the principal component directions. So lambda 1 is the biggest one, lambda 2, next biggest, and so on. Uh, so, so this is some notation to keep in your head. Um, there is an optimal um, parameter vector. Right? It's the one that minimizes the expected squared error. All right, so this is a classical linear regression. Our loss here is quadratic. And the, um, the parameter vector theta that, that minimizes the expected squared error of that prediction rule uh, we'll call theta star. And its expected squared error uh, is, is sigma squared. OK, so these are, the, these are the things to remember. And we're always in the, in the setting where sigma squared is greater than 0. Right? Um, uh, and OK, we're interested in interpolating the training data, but of course, uh, if, if we're in a big enough dimension that we can do that, then presumably we have some uh, linear subspace where we can interpolate the training data. So what are we going to choose out of that subspace uh, in, in parameter space? We're going to pick the minimum norm estimate. All right, so this is a specific, and, and, and I guess classical theory tells us that we can't pick just anything in that subspace. Right? We know that, that there are bad solutions um, that, that uh, uh, have an empirical error that's way smaller than the expected error. 
the, the best expected error. So which one are we going to choose? We're going to pick the minimum norm estimator. So we have our data, our sample of size n. Think of x as a matrix with n rows. So the usual notation in finite dimensions, but as I say, um, these x's could be in Hilbert space. Um, we have a vector of responses y. So n is the sample size. And our estimator is the solution to this optimization problem. The constraint there is that the squared error is the best we can do on that sample, right? So it's least squares. Subject to that constraint, pick the minimum norm uh, parameter vector, okay? And, and we're in the regime where that constraint says actually this minimum is zero and, and you know, we're looking among the set of thetas that give us zero training error, that is that interpolate every point, okay? And, uh, and among those interpolating prediction rules, pick the one that has the smallest parameter vector. We're interested in how well we predict and our, our um, uh, figure of merit here is the excess prediction error, right? The expected square difference between our prediction with that, with that estimate theta hat um, uh, and the actual um, outcome versus the same thing uh, with the optimal value of theta. Okay, so that second term was with theta star, just to remind you of that notation, and that, that expectation of this term is, is little sigma squared. Okay, so easy calculation. You can see that this excess prediction error is just a particular notion of our parameter, the error of our parameter estimate, right? The cross terms vanish and we get that, that actually it's just a quadratic form in theta hat minus theta star, how far our estimate is away from the optimal parameter. Okay, so this sigma tells us what are the directions that matter. You remember when we did the spectral decomposition of sigma into these lambda i's, we better get the lambda one direction right, or we'll get a big contribution to error, right? The, the, the smaller values of the lambdas don't matter so much. Okay, so that's, you know, one reason why these lambda i's are really crucial. All right, so here's the main result. Um, uh, actually, one, one comment before I present the theorem. So, so we've been seeing a lot of regularized empirical risk um, optimization problems through the, the, the three talks that we saw, that we saw so far today. Um, you know, and you think of that as there's an empirical risk term, that second term, and there's a, a complexity term. In our case, we're thinking of it as the Euclidean norm squared of our, of our parameter vector. There are a couple of equivalent ways of writing that sort of an optimization problem, right? We can think of that as the Lagrangian of a constrained optimization, where we minimize the performance on the trading data subject to a constraint on the complexity, right? Complexity measured according to this Euclidean norm. Alternatively, we could think of it as minimizing the complexity subject to a constraint on the fit to the data, okay? Um, the striking thing about the situation that we're in here is we're, we're picking this, we're, we're using this sort of a case, but we're picking the constraint on the fit to the data in this unrealistic regime, right? This C that we impose is, is zero, right? Well, certainly, it's much less than sigma squared, the, the best possible um, uh, expected squared error. Uh, so, so once we get down well below that, that um, uh, best possible, we're in this overfitting regime. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the case that we're, we're interested in. Okay, so um, within that regime, you know, we've got this, this uh, I I in particular when we're in a uh, high enough dimensional setting, um, we, we can um, uh, minimize this, uh, squared error on the training sample, we can actually drive it down to zero, which means our estimator is interpolating every, every training example. Okay, so if you think about what that means, these yi's are, are, are noisy, right? There is, the sigma squared there is, is bigger than zero. So we're taking all of the noise that's in the, in the training labels and we're injecting it into our, our parameter estimate theta hat. Okay, so all of that noise energy that's scaling with the sample size is being injected into theta hat. That just sounds like a terrible idea, right? And we're asking, when is it that all of that label noise can be hidden in our parameter estimates and not hurt predictive accuracy? That's, that's precisely the question we're, we're interested in here, okay? Um, and, and just stepping back for a second, I'm not advocating this as an approach to linear regression, <laughs> right? Just interested in, you know, when can we uh, take this, this approach and still do okay, you know, when is it not, not uh, a crazy idea to be interpolating in this way? 
All right, and, and here's the theorem that gives us the characterization of the circumstances under which we can do this crazy thing and, and still get pretty good predictive accuracy. All right, so, or, or any level of um, uh, uh, excess risk. Okay, so there are universal constants. Our linear regression problem is parameterized by these three things, the optimal parameter vector, the level of noise, and the um, covariance matrix. We have to be in a setting where we can interpolate. Um, so, so we need to have kind of n dimensions to work with, uh, where n is the sample size. And now we're going to have, there's a sort of critical dimension, k star. Um, uh, I'll say what, what this definition really means. It depends on a sort of um, uh, effective rank of the covariance in um, a subspace of the input space where we've ignored the first k dimensions, the, the heaviest k dimensions highest variance directions. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say this precisely in a moment, but um, for now, um, just bear with me. There's a certain critical dimension, k star, and the upper bound says the excess risk, so how much this minimum norm interpolating prediction rule exceeds the optimal is no more than this first term depends on sort of scale of the problem, um, scale of the variance. You know, this thing is, uh, is, is sort of like the, the um, total... Uh, sum of the variances in the different directions divided by n. So this is somewhat like a classical, uh, classical quantity. Um, you know, it's not at all the interesting part. It's, it's sort of something corresponding to the signal part of our, of our labels in the training sample. And it's the other two terms that are, that are interesting. These are the ones that correspond to the noise part. Um, and, um, you know, it's somewhat surprising we can take all the noise energy and inject it into our theta hat and it doesn't hurt the effective risk too much, how much does it hurt it? Well, we get a k star over n for this critical dimension k star, and then we get an n over capital R k star of sigma. So this is another notion of effective rank. I'll tell you what it is in a moment. So you can see we want k star, this critical dimension, to be not too big, and we want r k star to be really big, right, compared to n, both compared to n. Um, that's what we want to get that upper bound small. Turns out it's, it's tight, that within constant factors we can't do any better than this quantity. We get exactly the same thing, k star over n plus n over r k star um, as a lower bound. And that first term, the, the classical term, you can, you know, modulo a log factor, you can say, well, if you don't have this thing big, com uh, small compared to that, then you're in trouble. You get something that's bigger than a constant as your excess risk. Okay, so, you know, we don't have... We don't have a lower bound in terms of a rate there, but we do have, uh, you know, that we better have some monotone function of this um, R0 sigma over N uh, modulo a log factor. Okay, so, you know, everything, everything there is, is necessary. In the interesting terms, the, the noise terms, um, you know, it's, it, the upper and lower bounds are within constant factors of each other. Okay, so what is, what is little RK and capital RK? What do those things mean? They're effective ranks of uh, the covariance matrix in a, in a particular subspace. So remember, we've, we had this spectral decomposition of our covariance matrix. So lambda 1 is the highest variance, the, the variance in the highest variance direction, um, and, and then lambda 2 and so on. Um, RK here is saying, well, ignore the first K directions, and then from K plus 1 onwards, we're going to consider the covariance in those directions, so the lower variance directions. And we're interested in the L1 norm of those lambdas divided by the L, L infinity norm, right? So the sum of them divided by the maximum. And, and that's an effective rank. It's sort of how many times does that maximum one appear in, the, in all the rest, right? And the capital RK is two slightly different norms, right? It's the L1 norm squared divided by the L2 norm squared, right? Again, another notion of effective rank. They're slightly different notions of effective rank, but um, qualitatively the same kind of a thing. So they're saying once we skip the top, the, the k highest variance directions and look in that remaining subspace, then what's the effective rank of the covariance in that subspace? Right? What's the effective number of, of directions we have there? Um, you can relate these two. They're always at least one. Uh, capital RK is bigger than little RK, but not too much bigger. It's smaller than RK, little RK squared. Um, you know, this, it's an easy exercise to prove, prove this sort of thing. Um, and just to give some intuition with a, a couple of examples, so these are the definitions. If we think about uh, the finite dimensional case, suppose we had an identity, so isotropic 
um, then, then you know, both of these are just the rank of that matrix. But there's some notion of symmetry required here, right? So if we have a rank P matrix, then we can write these, I'll write R0, so I'm not going to ignore any directions. Um, the, the little r effective rank is the actual rank times some notion of symmetry. That notion of symmetry is, you know, the average across the P versus the biggest one. Um, uh, capital R is the same thing, but with a slightly different notion of symmetry. And those, those symmetry quantities vary between, you know, effectively 0 and 1, right? So, so it's like the effective rank, but it might be much smaller if it's asymmetric, right? If, if things are uh, uh, very different across those P, P directions. Okay, so, so these are the notions of effective rank, and then you can see in the theorem the critical dimension, k star, that's uh, the number of, of directions that we should exclude, that we need to exclude before the effective rank gets bigger than sample size. Okay, so once we hit, once we've, we've excluded enough of these heavy directions, um, that defines k star. Now having defined k star, it better not be too big compared to n. And the effective rank with this other notion, the capital R k star, um, uh, should be big compared to n. All right, and, and their upper and lower bounds. Okay, so there are some obvious uh, consequences, some obvious intuition to this. Um, so, so, you know, what's behind the result? We've got these lambdas determining both how we take the label noise and distribute it across different directions in our parameter space, um, and also how the errors in those different directions affect the predict prediction accuracy. Okay, so it's the combination of those two factors that lead to the result. Um, and, you know, qualitatively, the theorem says that in order to avoid hurting prediction accuracy, we've got to have um, many unimportant directions where we can spread the noise energy. Okay, so we have to, af after we've gone through those K heavy directions, high variance directions, the ones that really matter, um, then we've got a lot, of, a lot of directions compared to, to little n. We need that n over capital R K star to be, um, to be small. So, you know, need lots more parameters than sample size, certainly. Um, um, so have to have a large number of non-zero eigenvalues to get that capital R K star being uh, nice and big. Um, from the first term, the sum of all of the eigenvalues should be small compared to n. That's just a scaling issue. Um, uh, from the, um, the capital R k star term, we need to have those small eigenvalues, uh, ma many, many of those small eigenvalues. Um, and we want them to be roughly equal, right? I mean, we, they, they can be asymmetric if there are many, many of them in some sense, right? Um, so that's the hand wavy view of the, of the theorem. Um, let me give you a quick, a quick tour of the, the ideas behind the, the proof. Um, uh, you know, the key, the key observation here is a really classical one. We split up the um, um, excess expected loss into two components, one that's due to the signal part, so um, uh, the part that corresponds to the best linear prediction that you could, you could make, um, and then everything else, the noise part. Um, so, you know, our theta hat, so, so these two components give us, um, uh, contribute the first term and the, the last two terms. The, the first term is because theta hat's a bit of a distorted version of theta star, right? We're seeing it through this sample rather than through the actual covariance matrix. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a, um, there, there are some errors that arise out of that. That's really classical. The second part is something that's, that's new. Um, the theta hat is corrupted by taking all of the label noise and putting it into, the, into that theta hat. Um, first part is easy to deal with. Second part is, is somewhat strange. Um, and as I, as I say, this is the, the, the heart of the, of the problem. When can we take all of the noise in those labels and put it into our, our um, estimate without earning predictive accuracy? So let's define this epsilon as the noise vector. Right, so on our sample, capital X, we look at what the best linear predictions would be. That's capital X times theta star. So that's a vector of the, the predictions that the um, uh, optimal linear prediction rule would make. And then epsilon is everything else. Right? Um, so, so epsilon is, is the, you think of as the noise in the Y. Our estimator 
um, we can write in terms of this pseudo inverse, right? So, so you know, in this x transpose x pseudo inverse x transpose y is our is our least squares theta hat. It's a pseudo inverse because we're doing the minimum norm least squares in the case where where there are many um, least square solutions. <clears throat> and uh, of course, if y is x theta star plus epsilon, then there are two terms here that, that contribute to this, this theta hat, one due to the signal and one due to the noise. And the excess risk, we can split that up into those two terms as well, and you know, not so interesting. This is the signal part, and then the noise part involves this x transpose x pseudo inverse sigma, and the trace of that. Okay, so, so it's that second term that's the really interesting one. Um, and when we look at that excess risk and write sigma in this spectral decomposition, we can split things into the heavy directions, right, the highest variance directions and the light directions. Um, once we get up to the, it's, it's the light directions that are, that are actually interesting, but um, once we get up to this, this point <coughs> where um, RK, this effective rank, is bigger than N, then uh, the smallest non-zero eigenvalues of X transpose X are all concentrated. They all look like the trace of what's left, right? So, you know, this is, this is something that's straightforward to show. There are, in, in these sort of uh, concentration of quadratic forms results, there's a, um, uh, there are two terms. There's sort of the trace term and then the biggest eigenvalue term. And, and this condition, little RK being bigger than N, is saying that the trace term dominates, right? Um, uh, okay, so, so all of those eigenvalues are concentrated around the sum of the eigenvalues. Let's call that rho. Um, you know, one way to think of that is instead of x transpose x, write x, x transpose, an n by n matrix, right, the gram matrix. Uh, and we can say that that has all of its eigenvalues at least as big as rho. Okay, so now, um, you know, this is sort of reminiscent of ridge regression. In ridge regression, we take our x transpose x and we add in something that gives us a little, um, uh, you know, bounds our eigenvalues away from zero and then consider the inverse of that. Um, in this case, we're taking x transpose x pseudo inverse. So in all of the non-zero directions for that x transpose x, uh, we have a guarantee that all of those uh, eigenvalues are bounded away from zero again. And the ones that are actually zero, well, we zero out those directions anyway, so they don't hurt us. Right, so it's reminiscent of what goes on with, with ridge regression. Okay, and then when we look at this minimum norm estimator, you can kind of track through where the energy from all of the noise is going. It's, it's a, the energy is proportional to n, right? Uh, we, we have a sample of size n, and each, each example contributes sort of sigma squared energy um, uh, to it. Um, if we think in a direction vi, so this is one of these um, principal component directions, uh, which has uh, the eigenvalue lambda i, um, then the noise energy that we get from that x transpose epsilon is proportional to n times lambda i. Right? So where does that noise energy go? Well, it gets scaled by you know, this matrix, but all of the non-zero eigenvalues of this matrix are at least rho, so it gets scaled um, uh, by no more than 1 over rho squared. Uh, squared because we're talking about energies here. Um, and then the impact on the prediction error is scaled by another factor of lambda i, right, because of that um, observation that the excess risk uh, depends on our, predict our parameter error through this um, sigma and, and in the direction vi, that, that gives us another scaling of lambda i. So the bound on the prediction error from that one direction vi is like n times lambda i squared over rho squared. Um, turns out we can do better in the heavy directions, and when we sum those k heavy directions up with all of the other directions, we get this k over n plus n over r k sigma. Okay, this is where these two terms come from. And on the converse side, um, you know, you, you can show that this excess expected loss is at least as big as exactly the same expression. Um, when the eigenvalues are concentrated, you know, when you're in that regime, this, this r k sufficiently large re regime, then you get the same, the same split. You get the same lower bound within a constant factor. When the eigenvalues are not concentrated, then um, you know, there's a separate argument to, to say actually the excess expected loss is at least a constant. Right? So you get these matching upper and lower bounds. It, it really is precisely the right, the right thing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's the, that's the, main, the main theorem. Um, 
you can ask, you know, th this is telling us all about some property of the eigenvalues, the sequence of eigenvalues that determines the k star and the, and the rk star. We want k star to be small compared to n. We want rk star to be big compared to n. So what are the eigenvalue sequences that will lead to that, right? Um, you know, we, th this is a result that's true for any dimension for any n. Um, uh, we could ask, well, what if we're in infinite dimensions and we just want to know what happens asymptotically? Right, as n gets large. When, when are we in, in a nice situation? Well, we better have, you know, this is effectively saying the sum of the eigenvalues should be small compared to n, and then this term should go to zero, and this term should go to zero. When do we have all that happening? Well, let's define, in the infinite dimensional case, let's define a covariance as asymptotically benign if in the limit all of those terms go to zero. Right? And we can ask, so for what sigmas do we have an asymptotic, uh, are we asymptotically in this nice benign overfitting situation? <coughs> um, well, that's rather striking. If we, if we look at an example of lambda i going down as this polynomial, 1 over i to the alpha, and I've had to introduce another log factor here, right? And, and, and it's because there's an if and only if. That sigma, that, that covariance um, matrix that has this, this sequence of eigenvalues is benign if and only if alpha is 1 and beta is greater than 1, right? So you have a log to some power that's uh, in the denominator, a log to some power that's, that's bigger than 1. So, you know, you, you're right at the edge of being summable. You want something that goes down as slow as possible. You need it to be summable because we want a finite amount of energy in our input. Um, and, and we're right at the edge of being summable. That's the only case, right? So the lambda i's have to be almost diverging. Seems like a really... Um, extraordinary phenomenon that you would never expect to see, right? Okay, so, so you know, that's a, that's a rather striking thing. It seems like we've proved that if and you, you get this benign overfitting, if and only if the eigenvalues decrease at this sort of slow as possible rate to make things converge. Yeah, Francis. Yes. So wait for the next slide. So the question was, aren't I asking for, for a lot? A am I not asking for a lot here, right? Um, uh, yes, so to look at the infinite dimensional case and say asymptotically everything's going to look good, turns out you know, we really are asking for a lot. It's very, very specific when in the infinite dimensional setting we get, we get this sort of convergence. But if we go to the finite dimensional setting, so think about truncating things at some perhaps very large dimension. Here's an easy example. Think about eigenvalues that decay like e to the minus uh, k. Uh, and we add some constant onto those up to dimension p. All right, we're going to make sure that p is nice and big compared to n. We're going to make sure that epsilon n is nice and small compared to, uh, well, you know, we'll see. Actually, it's, there you go, it's written there. We, we get that this sequence, so after p, the eigenvalues are all zero. So we've truncated at p. We've got something that converges fast, and then we've got added onto that some isotropic noise, right? And, and if that's what our, our uh, covariates look like, then um, uh, as long as we truncate it at some, some dimension that's big compared to n, and as long as the total energy that we added in that isotropic noise, the epsilon n times pn, is small compared to n, uh, then we're in good shape. Right? We have this nice asymptotic uh, property. Um, can't be too small, of course. Right? If we set epsilon n to zero, then we're in a situation that doesn't work. Right? You know, the, the polynomial case, um, we couldn't have anything close to exponential convergence there. Right? So epsilon n does have to be positive, but the, the requirement on it is, is really mild. Right? Um, epsilon n times pn has to be big compared to something exponentially smaller than n. OK. Um, and, and, you know, you could make this precise. If pn is bigger than a, a constant times n, um, and the, the constant part is not too tiny, then the excess risk looks like epsilon n pn over n plus n over pn. Okay, and, and this requirement that we truncate at a point that's not too small, you know, is really... Um, uh, I'm sorry, this requirement that we have some some minimal level of noise is, is a really pretty mild one. Um, you know, if we think about how big n has to be before that, that sort of quantity needs to be bigger than like machine precision, it's, it's, it's tiny. So this seems like a much more generic phenomenon, right? A, a quickly converging lambda i that has some extra um, noise in all directions and we truncate at a finite dimension. Finite but, but large dimension, large compared to n. 
So we, that's a situation where, where we do get this benign overfitting arising. Um, there's a more general, more general one if we think about a finite dimension where we have slow eigenvalue decay and we truncate at some pn. All right, so then we get, we're in the benign situation as long as it's slow enough that we can't, we can't sum the infinite sequence, right? And pn is big compared to n. Or if we're just at the boundary, I guess I didn't add the log, log factors here, but you know, if we're just at the boundary of being summable, you know, there's a more refined condition. But uh, you know, I think it's, it's really quite a, quite a universal thing. You think of, think of these lambdas as decaying slowly and, and you know, lambda having a constant added into some fast decaying thing is a special case of that. Right, lambda's decaying slowly and then being truncated at some point that's, that's large compared to n, that's the set setting where we get um, benign overfitting. Okay, um, so, so you know, being in a finite dimension seems to be important unless we have this very special, special sort of a, a case. Okay, so I said that we could go beyond this Bau uh, Gaussian case. Um, uh, you know, the assumptions that we need are things need to be well specified. So it's a linear, linear model. The, the conditional expectation is given by that best prediction rule. Um, our noise needs to be sub-Gaussian and uh, we need our x's to be sub-Gaussian. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's more specific than that. We need that the components that we can whiten things um, uh, actually ignore the specifics on the slide. The, the, the condition we need is that we can whiten things and get, um, and get to a vector that has independent component, independent sub-Gaussian components. Okay. Um, okay, and, and you know, we don't know what to do in the misspecified case. With less independence, um, I, uh, I think we could deal with that, with that case. Um, and, and you know, a, an example that's really interesting there is um, uh, the kernel case. Right, where, where you think of these, um, uh, you're, you're in a linear setting that arises from um, perhaps a smooth map from a low dimensional um, uh, space. Uh, and certainly you don't have this sort of independence, independence condition here. Okay, um, and there's been a whole bunch of work, a bunch of work that suggests that you, know, you can't hope to do anything in general. Um, so so uh, Sasha Rachlin um, and, and his student uh, Jai have, have a result for a specific kernel um, uh, that, that demonstrates that. Um, uh, okay, so just quickly, let me say a few words about um, about deep learning. So uh, we've seen these neural tangent kernels. Uh, Francis told us all about that, that if you, if you set the initialization in an appropriate way, you have a very wide uh, network, then you get very fast convergence that, that um, keeps you in a regime that means the, the first order Taylor series approximation is, um, is good. Um, uh, you can think of that as, as a minimum norm interpolating solution um, where you're measuring the norm with respect to your starting point and, um, you know, there's a very specific kernel. Um, uh, you know, that's the, 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 um, that regime is, is somewhat outside what we can prove results about, as I say, because we need this, this independence requirement. Um, uh, even so, I, you know, I, I agree with the comments we heard earlier. I don't think that's a very... Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that can be the, the whole story, this linear, linear viewpoint. Um, uh, I mentioned that. Okay, so let me say a couple of words about adversarial examples. Um, the label noise is being injected into our parameter estimates. So we have a huge um, uh, amount of energy in some direction, right? In the direction corresponding to wherever that noise gets transformed, right, through our... Um, I haven't written it as a pseudo-inverse, but it's equivalent, right? That, that noise gets transformed into a, a, a direction that's just huge. Um, uh, and you can show, you know, in that direction, you have a very big sensitivity. So if you look at a unit norm, the, the unit norm direction corresponding to where the noise led you, um, it doesn't have an impact on predictive accuracy, right? So it must be in a direction, or with high probability, in a direction that doesn't matter from the perspective of, you know, our... Our, um, our conditions. So the covariance, there's very little variance in that direction. We won't see inputs in that direction. 
Um, uh, but the sensitivity in that direction is larger than something that you can lower bound in terms of one of the terms in this, in this upper bound on um, excess risk. So if you're predicting well um, with this, in this overfitting regime, then you're inevitably sensitive to adversarial examples, St sensitive to these sort of small shifts in, in the, the right direction. It's, a, it's an if and only if. Okay, um, uh, I think there are lots of interesting directions, um, uh, you know, looking at what happens in this, the whole of this overfitting regime, looking at what happens in the nonlinear case, uh, I think is very interesting. Um, um, you know, understanding the analog of these minimum norm linear prediction rules in the nonlinear case. Um, uh, we've heard all about implicit regularization um, and, and uh, uh, you know, I think it's a very interesting direction to understand the, the sort of generalization properties um, uh, when you're in this overfitting regime. Um, uh, I guess there are two points to, to take away. You know, this is a simple setting where we, we can analyze things in a rather complete way. Get this, get this, you know, within constant factors, characterization of when interpolation is, is okay and when it's not. Um, uh, you know, we're certainly far from the sort of classical regimes that, that um, people think about in a non-parametric setting. But, um, you know, the, the intuition behind the result is we have to have lots of unimportant directions where we can hide the noise. Um, uh, they have to be somehow roughly equally unimportant. Right? That seems to be, seems to be crucial here. Um, the other thing that seems to be important is having uh, finite dimensional data, so truncating at some finite but, but very large compared to the sample size, truncating at some finite dimension. Um, uh, if, we, if we constrain ourselves to be in an infinite dimension, we need a very specific uh, eigenvalue decay, decay rate. Um, on the other hand, when we truncate a slow decay rate, we get some sort of a generic um, situation where, where uh, overfitting is, is benign. <coughs> Um, but of course, in, in the linear case, it's, it's really uh, uh, trivial to see that, um, you know, having benign overfitting means we are going to be subject to this um, huge sensitivity to small perturbations to our, our inputs. All right, I'll stop there. <laughs>